So first, let me ask you uh, to introduce yourself a little bit, because I don't really know your entire background, except that you, you were a, a DJ and a radio presenter and that you have been studying uh, conspiracies in the field of music and exposing those, um, at presumably on radio. And I guess you've done speaking tours as well. Uh, can yeah. you uh, tell what else have you been doing uh, related to conspiracy, music and the subjects we'll be talking about? Pretty much all of that, yeah. I'm a former club and radio DJ. I did that as a full-time job for about 20 years, 20 odd years. I got to travel widely all around the world. Uh, very grateful for that. Got to see uh, many fascinating countries. But I got to the point round about 15 years ago where I started to have some big, qu big questions about what was really going on in the world, uh, who was really running things, and even deeper than that, the nature of this reality, what this place even is in the first place and what we're doing here. And that's only deepened as I've uh, gone on. But in the early days, I got into conspiracy research and it was facts, figures, places, dates, names. So I was learning about the Bilderberg Group and the Illuminati so-called and, you know, the Council on Foreign Relations, Freemasons, this sort of thing. That led me to research the true nature of the music industry, which I've been a part of. I wanted to comprehend better how that was used as a vehicle for social engineering, mass mind control, pushing of occult symbolism, this sort of thing. So that became my specialist area of interest. And I didn't really see any other researchers who were looking into that stuff full time and putting out books on it and doing lectures and uh, you know, public talks and podcasts and such. So I kind of created that job for myself. I filled that gap and that's become my niche. So I've become very well known for exposing the true nature of the music industry and entertainment and popular culture generally. And of course, that's only one part of the jigsaw puzzle in terms of how it slots alongside all the other parts. Uh, you know, the banking and financial system, uh, the geopolitical arena, the, the world of the occult, uh, Satanism, all this sort of stuff, it all slots in together. Mm. So I just see me as playing my part in making that contribution. And I've put out many books. I've done hundreds and hundreds of radio shows and podcasts and many speaking tours and events just presenting this kind of information. More recently, I've got into some other subjects, which I think we want to talk about today. And I've gone really deep uh, down about 500 different rabbit holes. And uh, yeah, I've got a feeling we're going to touch on some of that subject matter today. But in a nutshell, that's my background. Yeah, it sounds like we've started kind of in a similar vein and ended up in the same kind of place. Because when I got into all of this, it was also through kind of researching about secret societies and banking and uh, false flag conspiracies and these kind of things. And that has led me into some of the deeper, let's say, more spiritual uh, conspiracies. Um, along the way, uh, both of us, I guess, learned about Flat Earth and, uh, you know, the globe lie as well. Um, but now have we both uh, independently, seemingly, of each other, but also uh, at the same time kind of come across this subject, which is gaining traction quite a bit, which I guess has been dubbed the reincarnation soul trap, uh, is one way to call it. Um, but really, it's just questions. It's it's where my agnostic worldview has led me by not believing in any standard theologies or, um, you know, uh, grasping on to a religion or, or some explanation like most people seem to do for uh, afterlife, just waiting, observing, uh, you know, seeing people who have had near-death experiences, uh, intuiting my own thoughts about what may or may not uh, happen after death, reading the holy books of different religions and pondering what this all means, I've come to certain conclusions, or at least um, uh, I've stepped back from certain conclusions that other people have made to wonder about certain things, um, namely whether this reality is the only one, whether God, quote unquote, is wholly benevolent, and whether there may be something below that that is ruling this place, which is similar to, say, what like the Bible says, that there is, um, 
God, an omniscient, omnipotent, omnipresent, creative force. But then that this God created this alternative force just below him, this evil version, you know, Lucifer, or Satan, the devil. And this demigod is then blamed for a whole bunch of things that are present in this reality, negative things. Um, and I wonder, why are they present at all? If God is supposed to be holy, benevolent, loving, and omniscient, omnipresent, you know, all-knowing, all-powerful, what reason is there for all the negativity that exists in the world? If you could create anything at all, you're God, all-powerful, able to create heaven, able to create perfect beings, why would you create anything less? And if you did, why would you then force them to go through cycles of reincarnation and karma or having to be saved by a savior, you know, uh, um, you know, getting rid of your sins, as some people say? Why would you create fallen beings or even the ability for them to become so fallen that they need to have this long, drawn-out process of uh, becoming more and more spiritual, and then, then they'll be able to go to your heaven realm. Oh, so there, so there's a there's a heaven realm with with spiritual perfect beings, but then we're here in this lesser realm, and we're lesser beings. So my big question is, what is this place? Who are we? Why are we here? Why is this place created? You know. So I've got a lot of these questions about the creator and my place in the creation that none of the current religions have really satisfied. Right. Yeah, I've got those same questions. Most people that you encounter in your regular daily life are just wandering around as if they know exactly who they are, what they're doing here. It's either that or they just don't think to ask these big questions. And that amazes me how somebody cannot ask the biggest questions that a human ever can. Who am I? How did I get here? What am I doing here? What's the point of it all? What created this realm? And where am I going when it's all done? And you absolutely nailed it in that short video you put out recently titled, You Know Nothing. And you used the metaphor of the boat. You know, a bunch of people are out at sea on a boat. None of them know how they got there. They just woke up one day, they're on the boat. All you can see around you is open ocean. There's no sign of land. Nobody knows where the boat is headed. Nobody knows who built the boat. That is a perfect metaphor for the conditions in which we find ourselves. And how can anyone not question what all that is about? I've got three uh, sort of overriding questions, Eric. And you're probably aware that I put out a video the other week titled, Is God Really Good? That one really set the cat among the pigeons, ruffled some feathers, rattled some cages, mainly among those who identify as Christians. So I had a whole bunch of people who said that they're Christians and they made response videos about me. So that was the way they dealt with the, the, the questions that I was asking, because that's what those videos consisted of. Ultimately, if anyone watches them and studies the content, they will see that I was asking questions. But the response of these people to my questions was to make a bunch of videos saying, oh, Mark Devlin's in a really bad place. Oh, he's really fallen. Not one of them thought to try and extend a hand of fellowship, of friendship to say, brother, I can see that, you you know, you're suffering. Uh, let me help you. Let me try and answer some of these questions. Didn't get any of that. Just condemnation because people don't like to hear these questions asked. So I just want to recap on what those three big questions were, and then I'd love to get your take on it, although I suspect you've got the same questions as me because you just touched on one of them there. So the first one is, why is there a direct observable correlation between the amount of good work that you try and put into the world, the amount of help that you try and offer to others, the amount of service that you try to put into creation to the rest of humanity and the amount of suffering and hardship that you will reap as a result. So you can use the scientific method on this one. It's observable. It's testable. It's repeatable. Try it. 
anyone out there, try doing good work, helping others, doing what you know to be right, putting others before yourself, selflessly being in service to creation and see what happens to you. I think you will find that you reap a whole load of shit in your life as a result. Suffering, hardships, obstacles. Everyone I know in my personal circle of contacts and friends is going through hardship of that nature right now. And, you know, they're generally good people that try and do the right thing. So that's question number one. If we have a loving, benevolent God, if that's what it is, why are good people made to suffer so much? Question number two, which I've heard you raise before as well, is if we have a loving, benevolent God who, as you say, could have created anything that it wanted, any kind of conditions, why is the natural world, the animal kingdom, so brutal and horrific? Why is it necessary for billions of living sentient creatures to have to murder each other in absolutely horrific ways just to survive another day themselves in the food chain that we have. So those are the two main questions. And then there's another one which piles on top of that. If we are living in a realm which has been somehow hijacked, subverted, steered off by some kind of demiurge, some kind of, you know, lesser God, some sort of demonic entity which took original creation, which the original creator God would have put into place and created a bastardized version of it. You know, this gets into simulation theory and all sorts of other theories. Where was God when this happened? So original God, what did he fall asleep? Was he taking a nap? Was he snoozing on his hammock? You know, how could he have allowed his beautiful, perfect, original creation to have been stolen by some lesser being those are big questions right there that last one is a big one because even if you try to explain it away as this is satan's realm you know we're here this is hell even whatever well then why does god create and allow all of these things and when people cry out in pain and suffering crying out for his name when has he ever appeared and, and alleviated suffering. Or, or, you know, if this whole place is an abomination, why hasn't it been dealt with? If he's omnipresent, omniscient, you know, all-knowing, all-powerful, all-present. Can do anything, right? Yeah, so he's allowing everything. It's like I said in another video. Uh, once you start asking questions about the inherent negatives here, God switches from the supreme creator to the all-allower. All and uh, Christians will be like, you know, well, he just allows it. Well, he created it and then allows it, just like you're saying, if there's a demigod that is in control of this world, but supposedly the the best god, the ultimate god, the one that's all-knowing and all-powerful, is just not doing anything about it, well, what does that say about that god? So, yeah, very interesting question there on the third one. The right. first one, it's like reverse karma. Um, like you're saying, the better you do, the more, and that's like the story of the Bible. It's like God incarnates here, tries to save everyone, is completely selfless, and what does the world do to him? They kill him. You know, they condemn him. And so that is a great allegory for this world. Even if God tries to incarnate in this hellish realm, he can't help it. We just crucify him and kill him, (laughs) get him out of here. That's how hellish this place is. And that's what the Bible story is telling me. But most Christians read it and they hear something totally different and they want to sing songs and praises to the creator of this realm. And I'm just not getting that. And uh, what was the second one again? Well, the Uh, other one was about the animal kingdom and how brutal it is. Exactly. And so there's so many things like that, how there's predators and psychopaths and parasites and this food chain and just dying, aging, um, you know, disease. There's so many things here that why? Why did that have to be part of creation? And the only answer I ever get is, well, duality. You have to know you have to there has to be black for you to understand white and all this stuff. And there's aspects, there's nuance to duality that people are missing here. 
you don't have to have psychopaths in your reality. You don't have to have predators murdering each other, and you don't have to have to eat the life out of living beings just to survive in your realm, just um, so that we understand, you know, what negative negativity is. Uh, duality as a, a single answer doesn't cut it for the extreme amount of suffering that we see here. And I've also presented the idea that if you were to have, say, an hour of the best pleasure ever here, and then afterwards you had to be subjected to an hour of the worst physical torture here, would anybody actually take it? Because the pleasures, whatever you can think of that you could spend an hour pleasurably doing here on Earth, is not nearly as pleasurable, pleasurable as the pain that uh, the most torturous thing that's possible here is. And so when you talk about duality, oh, well, you need to know the black to, to be able to appreciate the white, Eric. Well, why does the black have to be so pitch black? And why is the white only kind of off white and not even that great? That's not, that's not the kind of duality I'm interested in. If anything, I would like it to be completely the opposite where the suffering is so light that it, you know you you feel you know somebody cuts your arm or something it's like oh okay yeah. i won't do that again but why does it have to kill us you know if i don't stop the bleeding within uh, you know i'm just gonna it, it we're so that's another thing our bodies are so weak and and so we suffer and die so easily and we're only uh, we're limited too like hmm. we, we get to watch birds fly in the sky and we get to watch fish um, breathe underwater, and they, they have this whole life. M meanwhile, we're just stuck on this one, <laughs> this one area of this particular creation. You know, why, why weren't we, we given wings, and why can't we breathe underwater? Why does everything hurt so much? Right. There's so many questions like this, uh, and so we've been limited. We we've been given this very limited spectrum of experiential possibility, and so much of it is negative. And that's absolutely my question. So that's kind of your second one there. Oh, and with that first one again, the reverse karma thing. It's as I say, uh, no Total good deed goes unpunished. No it's good like, deed so, goes unpunished. Exactly. It's a cliche. And so, which is it? Is karma a thing, or is this reverse karma a thing? Because when you look at reality, um, usually the rich psychopaths, the, some of the worst people, the most selfish people, are having the best lives here. Bill Gates, in, Klaus Schwab doing really well, having a great <laughs> life. Right. Meanwhile, Jesus and uh, other people, you know, or fictional people <laughs> trying to save people, uh, we ended up uh, suffering inevitably. Right. So right. what is going on here? Exactly. And just to your point there about how things seem to be weighted in favor of pain and suffering and death and all this, uh, just compare an orgasm, which might last, if you're lucky, a few seconds, or a male orgasm anyway, maybe females are a bit luckier, uh, with dropping a hammer on your foot. So the orgasm would be over in a few seconds. You drop a hammer on your foot, it's going to take longer than a few seconds for that to wear off. So yeah, right. that kind of illustrates the point. Another question for me would be, if we are living in a realm which is presided over by a malevolent entity, and there's so much evidence to suggest that this is the case, not least the suffering of so many good people, as I just mentioned, no good deed go goes unpunished. Why is there still so much beauty in the world as well? So, you know, you've got the suffering and the, the, the horrors of the, the natural world, the food chain. But you think of something like solstices, equinoxes, the movement of the sun and the moon, that beautiful rhythm as they go about their journey through the solar year, you know, and you think about sunsets and beaches and oceans and valleys. And uh, I went to Iceland once, the country of Iceland, and the geology there just absolutely blew me away. It's got everything, volcanoes, valleys, lakes, hills, icy tundras, absolutely awesome, breathtaking. It's beautiful. So how can we have that in the same realm as all this suffering, all this hardship, so many people going through so much shit. And it seems to have been escalating in recent years as well. So like I say, pretty much everyone I know, and I know a lot of people now because I've done 
a lot of talks and I've done a lot of events and many conferences. I've met many, many people. Most of them, I would say, are generally good people who stand on the side of truth and freedom and justice and love. And yet they're all going through a whole load of crap. It might be financial problems. It might be relationship, family problems. It might be mental health, physical health. But everyone is going through something. What's that all about? And how can we have a realm which is so beautiful, but at the same time is full of so much pain, suffering, anguish, torment? And like we were saying, none of us really knows what we're doing here. If right. we're going to be honest with ourselves, and that's why your stance of agnosticism at this point for me is the only one that makes any sense. None of us really know. And we have to be prepared to admit that we don't know. Just be mature about it. Be grown up. Be responsible and just say, we don't know. And most people take that stance as some kind of defeatist thing. Like, no, we can know more than that. Look at these holy books. Look at what these people believe. Whereas I see it as the only foundation we can really have is this kind of foundationless foundation. Uh, like I said, adrift on a boat. We, we really don't know. Nobody remembers their birth before their birth and all their reincarnations and how this world came to be and how God created us and all these things. So everybody, it's a mystery to everybody. Everybody has these same questions, but I find it similar, say, to the globe earth lie, is that when somebody like NASA comes around and gives you answers for every single question you could have about cosmology, and they say it with an authoritative tone, and every time you have a new question, they authoritatively come along and say, oh, well, it's blah, 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 blah. You just feel comforted and reassured and you're like, yeah, I know what's going on here. Just trust NASA. And people do the same thing with religions and religious books. These highly allegorical, metaphorical books that often when you read them, you could interpret them any which way, including the exact opposite way of somebody reading it next to you. But then you take <laughs> those subjective uh, realizations and then you apply to them uh objective truth and you're just like oh well i know what's going on here i know exactly who god is and why god created everything and why it is this way it says right here in jebediah 3 17 and so uh if if your standard of truth is that easy you just go to neil degrasse tyson and say what is gravity and and <laughs> whatever he <laughs> spouts out you just regurgitate it well, yeah, there's some comfort in that because then you get to be the person that knows everything when somebody else comes along. Whereas agnosticism or flat earth or, you know, uh, conspiracy theories, have, having your own independent thought, you know, critical thinking about some of these subjects, rather than being an authority, rather than having all the answers and looking respectable, you are like the child looking at the emperor with no clothes. You are not an authority. You're the exact opposite of an authority. You have questions. You don't buy into whatever everyone else says, and you see through those cracks. Everyone else wants to plaster over the cracks. You see that with religious folks as well as the globe earth type folks. You pick a hole here, you pick a hole there. You're like, but what about this? This doesn't make any sense. This doesn't make any sense. And they're so willing to say, yes, it does or that doesn't matter. That crack is so small. And I find that's what this religious thinking does to people and the reason they want it. It's comforting. It's because the reality here, it's mysterious. It's, you know, we don't know what's going on. As we said, reality is pretty negative. So religion is like a nice warm blanket that you can wrap around yourself and be unaffected from all these questions and the mystery that abounds around us. And you can just be the authority and say, well, I know what it is. It says right here. But, uh, you know, reality is far more mysterious than any book I've found answers. And I've read all the religious books. And while they all may point to truth, none of them have a monopoly on it. And none of them have convinced me so well that I suddenly want to cloak myself in that label and now be a Christian, a Muslim, a Buddhist, a Jainist, or any other ist or ism, because I find reality far more mysterious than that. 
And if it's so easy to pick apart reality that you just pick one path that's already been chosen, what are we even alive for? I actually enjoy the detective work of this mystery. That is an interesting part of this reality, and that could be part of the answer to this question, is that we are meant to question this reality, and that is the escape route. If you're fully satisfied with this reality and you don't find it to be negative at all, maybe you belong here. Maybe this is your heaven to reincarnate to. And maybe the only people actually deserving of somewhere better are the people that can notice that things aren't quite right here and that we should be somewhere else. Well, I hope that's what it is, because one of my other big questions is, OK, if we accept that this reality is not presided over by a benevolent God, as we prefer to assume that it is, then how the hell do we get out of here? Because I don't remember ever signing up to be here in the first place. In fact, <clears throat> one of my very earliest childhood memories is as a young boy looking at myself in the mirror, staring at my reflection and thinking, this is a mistake. I shouldn't be here. Wow. And actually, I wasn't supposed to be here anyway, because my parents were told that they would never have kids. Mm -hmm. But uh, along I popped, stupid me for some reason. And here I am trying to make sense of it and figure it all out. But um, I think if you're someone who naturally asks questions, eventually you are going to arrive at this point and ask, what is the very nature of my existence? Why am I here? And how do I get out of it? So with me, it was a, a layered thing. You know, I took my first baby steps looking into the music conspiracy theories and you come across the one about Paul McCartney. You know, uh, the real Paul McCartney died in 1966, according to the popular theory, and he was replaced by an imposter. That one is not as simple as it appears on the surface. And you realize that there are no easy answers, but you'll have people insisting that there are. So you'll have researchers saying, oh, yeah, yeah, McCartney died in 1966 and the guy we got today is not the original one. Definitive fact. Then you'll have somebody else that will say, no, 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 this is the original Paul McCartney. We've still got, got him with us and there's no evidence to show that he died. Then you'll have someone muddying the waters and saying, actually, there's been two Paul McCartneys all along and we've just seen them paging in and out of the role. So everyone insists that they've got the right answers, but they can't all be right. Mm. They're either all wrong or somebody's right and somebody else is wrong. But mm -hmm. everyone will insist that they're right. And you get the same thing with religions. So a Christian will say, my holy book is the correct one. My God is the right one to believe in. And anyone else is a blasphemer and, um, you know, is going to hell. Then a Muslim will come along and say, no, no, you've got it wrong. My God's the right one. Hindu will say something else and so on. They can't all be right. But everyone wants to insist that they've got the answers. And when it comes to these questions of theology that we're all asking now, and I do find it interesting that you and I arrived at a similar point at a similar time, because I'd not seen your videos uh, at the point I started making mine. And then a few people said, oh, you should look at Eric Dubay's videos because he's asking the same questions as you. So something caused both of us to, you know, start asking these questions at the same time. And people will come along and try to provide the easy answers. So you've got the religious folk and they'll just regurgitate whatever it says in their special book. But then you've got the more new agey types. And this was a, a mindset that I kind of adhered to for quite a number of years. I've been an atheist. That didn't make any sense to me up to a point. So I spent about 15 years being an atheist. Then I came to realize, no, of course, there's got to be a creative generative force because here we are, you know, we're evidence of it. So something created us. It's absurd to deny that. It's just a question of what it is. And then the more new agey mindset is that, oh, well, in spirit soul form, we choose to incarnate here into these meat suit bodies and undergo these experiences. And we choose the lives we're going to have. We choose our parents. We choose our families. And if you're suffering in your life, it's because your soul chose that. So apparently, you know, a child who is wheelchair bound from the earliest age and is in and out of hospital their entire life and maybe only lives to about 11, 12 years of age and then some horrific disease finishes them off, them off chose that. 
if you're a torture victim or a serial killer victim uh, who's horrifically mutilated and dies that way, you chose that, according to these people. That doesn't make any sense to me anymore. And then you've got the whole memory wipe thing where people who claim that we have multiple lives and we come back time after time to undergo experiences and learn lessons and our souls need these experiences to grow. Uh, somehow you've got to explain how it is that your mind gets wiped every time you come in. So you forget all the lessons that you built up in your previous lives. People will say, well, you remember it through intuition and you get these feelings and you get sort of things in your subconscious mind that will guide you in the right direction. But to me, these are not adequate answers. They're akin to the answers you would get from NASA. Like you said, uh, they've got every answer in the book to explain or to prop up the spinning ball lie. Uh, they've got an answer for everything. But are they adequate answers? Do they really explain things or are they just there to pacify people and send them along their way so that they don't ask these big, important questions? Absolutely. I agree with that position. And the message we're getting from a lot of near death experiences, when you collate them and compare and contrast them, you find that it seems what people are experiencing in this post life state is whatever they believed they would experience. And this gets into some interesting and dangerous territory if you are one of these people who believes things rather than someone who's constantly skeptical. I've made it a point to not believe in things because I find belief to be a weak epistemic function. Rather than believing in things, just don't know. That's what an agnostic is. Uh, and that's a more powerful epistemic function because now you're involved in knowing and not knowing rather than debasing yourself into belief and, oh, you don't believe yet. And then other people like Christians, they elevate belief above knowledge and they'll say, oh, yeah, it's fine to have these questions, but you need to have faith and faith is what's going to save us. And so in their view, God has purposely made this world mysterious in a way that we can't know. And we are supposed to just believe in a book he left behind, and that will elevate us to heaven. Again, easy answers, but that is just a real, for, and for some people, like, yep, that makes sense. But for myself, yourself, and so many others, that is just too simple of an answer, similar to the, um, the mind wipe thing. It's a big question of mine. And then people will say, like you said, well, yeah, they, you erase all your memories, but somehow something is retained through your intuition. And that's, that's how your lessons you know, are learned and, and maintained. Really? So, like, so we go all the way through school and then we get an A minus. And then rather than uh, letting us through, they're like, nope, we're going to erase all your memory except for your intuitions about what just happened. Then you got to go through the whole school again until you get an A plus. And if you don't, we're going to erase everything again. You get your intuitions, okay, you know, but you still got to learn everything, go through a whole lifetime again, and then maybe you'll get out. The Buddhists and the Hindus, they think it takes thousands of lives to get through, and a lot of the New Agers say this as well. So what is this? What, what kind of uh, process is this? And do, do people really think that that's... Like, yay, that's what I want to do with my eternity is spend thousands of lifetimes forgetting what happened the previous one and then hoping and praying that I, I miraculously do the right thing this time on intuition because they erased every other thing. Right. Um, so, yeah, the, these answers, these easy answers that they give us with religion don't really do it for me. And when you study the near death experiences, you'll find that the religious people, oh, they see Jesus. And the non-religious people that miss their granddad, well, granddad appears. And the people that miss their dog, well, their dog appears. Uh, you know, if you thought it was going to be angel angelic beings of light because you're a new ager, well, you see angelic beings of light. So it seems like whatever you believe will happen gets integrated into your afterlife experience. And right. now belief suddenly becomes potentially a very negative thing. Whereas Christians think it's the most positive thing ever to have faith and have belief in something you don't know. What if that's what traps us here? 
What if your belief is what they use against you to bring you back here? And the right. only way to get out would be to be skeptical. Right. So along those lines, do you feel that if you're someone who believes or chooses to accept that when our lives are done, we just go into oblivion, we know nothing, we just cease to exist in any kind of way, that could be the kind of experience we have when our lives are done. Because a lot of people will be horrified with that notion and they'll say, oh, that's a terrible thing to expect. But I actually find some comfort in that. Maybe it's just me. Maybe I'm in a dark place as I've been accused of being. But I find the idea of when I've drawn my last breath and my body is done, I just go into nothingness. I know nothing. I experience nothing. I cease to exist in every possible way. I find some comfort in that. It's way more comforting than the concept of eternity. It's way more com uh, comforting than the concept of reincarnation, having to come back here, do it all over again. I would like to cease to exist. So do you think that's a kind of experience that you can have if that's what you anticipate and if that's what mm. you desire? Yeah, I wonder about that as well, if that could be the case. And I think if it is and could be the case, the only way you would experience it is to have that intention or at least that question because if you had a different intention a different belief or no questions then you're probably going to go in that direction um right. and th that's and, and i think what you said does that sounds more comforting than thousands of reincarnations in a hellish realm does but me. i yeah sure uh though i would like to come to some like i would if if i could um choose what happens in the afterlife and it does seem that this is somewhat what does happen in um the message we're getting from ndes is that when you leave your body you can move at the speed of thought so you think oh i want to go somewhere you're there and so you, you start to have these powers they say you can hear other people's thoughts and emotion you can feel their emotions everyone around you in a room so it's like we become way more expansive when we're outside of these physical bodies and we gain kind of superpowers in a sense. But then they're instantly corralled and ushered into another experience by these beings of light or these angels or dead relatives or a 15 foot tall Jesus comes and uh, judges your life and gives you a life review. And so they're pulled out of this new superpower state they find themselves in and suddenly being drawn into a tunnel of light or you know in a life review or all these other things and so they're led into some other experience rather than doing what would you like and that's kind of what i'm interested in is when i leave the body i want to really explore it's like i'm trying right now i, I have no kind of death wish a lot of people think that thinking about this is like real depressing and negative and like like you said oh the, the dark night of the soul or are you suicidal or something? It's like, no, I, I, I've always been an upbeat and positive person and researching this hasn't changed that at all. These are just questions that I have that I, I've had these same questions since I was a little child and my entire Christian family has tried to answer them the way that most of the people in my comments section try to answer them for me. And it's like, I've heard these answers <laughs> since I was a little kid. I'm, I'm still asking the same questions because I'm not satisfied with those answers that so many other people just seem super satisfied with. I've found holes in them. I've found other people that have different experiences, like I'm saying these near-death experiences or people um, like um, doing psychedelics, ayahuasca. Uh, they say that they enter the spirit world and they have all of these uh, interactions with often negative people trickster beings and that they uh, have a say in our creation and how we are so that there's a lot of you know connections from diff different points that you can pull together and make that don't necessarily um, speak to the the current religions in the world you know they, they don't answer it for me right I suppose the main reason why I said that I find the idea of just ceasing to exist attractive is because it's an attractive alternative to reincarnation, because yes. I just do not want to come back to this realm ever again in any form. I don't want to be here now. 
I didn't want to be here in the first place. I don't know what I'm doing here. I don't know if I was tricked. I don't know if I agreed to come. This is, goes back to what we were saying. We just don't know. But I wouldn't mind having some of these questions answered. And mm. you were speaking there about, you know, you can be anything and experience anything that you want just through the power of thought instantly when you're outside of these meat suit bodies, when you go back to the spirit world. Sure, I like the idea of uh, doing a bit of that for a, a while, you know, and exploring the biggest questions you can ask and finding out some of these mysteries that have plagued us throughout our lives. And I quite like the idea of a life review. I quite like to look back on everything that I've done all over again. But I also like the idea of when you've had enough of it, you can say, OK, I'm done now. I've experienced everything I want to. And that's it for me. I, I'm mm. out of here. Bye. I'm gone. I'm done. That's quite attractive to me as well. So what do you think is happening when people have near death experiences? You know, uh, we're all familiar with the accounts that they give. But do you think they're genuinely going back to some sort of spirit realm that we all came from? Or is it their mind playing tricks on them? And why do you think they come back into their bodies rather than crossing completely over? What's your take on that whole uh, dynamic? Mm. Yeah, I still leave that sliver that, you know, they're, they're near death experiences. They're not death experiences. So whatever does happen after death could have absolutely nothing to do with all of these near death experiences and everything that they're talking about. And all that does is leave me with more questions again. So even as I delve into all the near-death experience research and I compare and contrast it and I try to find inroads, and, okay, well, this seems to be what, you know, like I said about the belief thing, belief seems to be a, a bit of a risky thing in the afterlife realm. It seems like whatever you believe starts to manifest a lot easier. Um, so you got to be careful about that. But maybe that's just the near-death realm. Maybe death-death is... Uh, void nothingness and there's absolutely none of it and everything we're talking about it, it's just kind of a dream it's just the the last flickers of your brain before everything truly shuts off and you know the things people are experiencing 15 foot jesus or otherwise is just brain activity and then when that's done it's over that's i'm open to that as well so you know that's it, it could be I'm open to pretty much anything because I haven't seen concrete answers for any metaphysical questions. We're so in the dark. This place is so mysterious and that we don't even have a foundation to to get a footing to start to step off from, like we're saying here. I have no idea, even with near-death experiences, if all of these actually have anything to do with what ha truly happens after actual death. Right. And you touched on a, another important subject there, which is how do you cope with these thoughts and this kind of information when you come across it, when you start asking these questions? You're a more naturally upbeat and positive guy than me. I can see that. Uh, I'm someone who is here under duress, I feel. I'm just trudging through this life, doing what I know I must do, putting information out, trying to help others. And that's an important point as well. Even when you accept the possibility that this realm may be presided over by some sort of demiurge or Yeldabeoth or uh, lesser God, some sort of demonic entity, it still doesn't make me think, well, I'm just going to be evil then. I'm just going to be selfish, you know, because mm. um, if you do good things, you only suffer. So I'm just going to be uh, a selfish shit. Mm. It doesn't make me want to do that. I still want to do the right thing. So something is causing me to lean towards what I know to be right. Mm. But, um, yeah, when you come across these ideas, it's easy for it to really drag you down and, and make you feel quite depressed. And uh, somehow you have to find ways of staying upbeat and continuing to have reasons to keep doing what you're doing. Mm. What are your coping mechanisms in, in that type of scenario? Because, you know, I'm new to these ideas and I'm struggling, but I think you've probably got some... Uh, mechanisms that work for you mm. i guess for me i think i really find agnosticism and the act of not knowing to be empowering it seems like a paradox and i think that's what depresses people is that they think that if you are considering all these negative aspects if you 
admit that you have no foundation of knowledge, really, especially about the afterlife, then how can you have a positive life? How can you, you know, want to wake up in the morning and all this kind of stuff? For me, it, it's, I guess I, I enjoy the detective work of it all. If I'm here in a mystery, then, all right, that's my job. I, I want to, I'd like to be over with, you know, when, when the job's over, as I, I want the answers and then I want to move on to something else that's not a mystery. And so, so you were saying about like maybe disappearing into a void. I would like to experience heaven and like a perfect realm with with perfect people. I'd like to see whether this thing that everyone talks about duality and me not being able to appreciate the white if I don't have the black around me all the time. I want to see if that's true because I feel like I'm going to be uh, blissful in a blissful place. I feel like I'm going to be happy in a place with happy people. I don't feel like I really need all this negativity to appreciate the good things in life. I really feel like that's such a cop out. And I also feel like you're saying that I'm being drawn towards that in an inevitable way. You know, love exists here, beauty exists here. There is something positive out there <laughs> or in here. And that's not dying. I mean, that I feel like that's the creative impulse. The thing that's above any negativity that we can talk about is that love and beauty. That's always here. And, and it's abundant. And, and the mystery doesn't make that disappear. And I think when we, if and when we are able to see the totality of everything for what it is and it not be a mystery, the amount of love and beauty we'll experience then will probably be indescribable. And I'm hoping that we're part of something like that and that this is like a nightmare in God's dream. And when we wake up from it, we are in heaven <laughs> in our godly bed of clouds, wiping away a bead of sweat, realizing that, you know, wow, just so happy to be here. And I don't want to go to sleep again because <laughs> it does seem like that's what we're doing. We're asleep. We're, we're God asleep. We've forgotten who we truly are. And if and when we wake up, I expect to wake up to something much better than what we're experiencing here. And I think that's, so. and, and you could call that faith. I guess I do have kind of like a, a faith in that, but it's not, it's not faith in the sense that most people would talk about it. For me, it's, it's a philosophical one. I don't get how I could exist and that not be possible. I see love and beauty. I understand the nature of creation and a creator and omniscient, omnipotent, omnipresent. Well, you can create a perfect place with perfect people and just have a perfectly bliss, blissful time all the time. That's got to be possible for God. And so why would that not exist somewhere? Why would that experience not be available for us at some point in this thing we're experiencing here? I feel like that's the end. The end goal is when you get the big reveal, you are God, or something along those lines. You're at least a subjective aspect of God. You are a spark that came into this, you know, imagine like a dream. There's all these characters in the dreams, and they're doing all these things, and they all believe that they're separate individuals. But then at some point, the dreamer wakes up, and the characters in the dream disappear only to be replaced by the one mind that created them all in the first place. Well, isn't that a perfect metaphor for God and what and, and us? We are just the dream characters in God's dream. And when we die, when God wakes up, we realize it was all just a terrible nightmare. And in reality, <laughs> we're God blissing out in heaven. We were just having a bad dream on a cloud. Well, this is what this is what I used to accept. This used to make sense to me. The idea that we are individuated units of the divine, the one, you know, consciousness of, of the Godhead, call it what you will. Uh, and that used to work for me. But now I've got these bigger questions like, is this a realm that's been hijacked and subverted by some sort of demonic entity? 
And I'm thinking, well, do I want to be an aspect of that kind of God? Or is it that we're aspects of the original creator, original creation, and somehow we found ourselves in this hell realm? So those that adhere to the soul trap idea idea will tell you that we were somehow tricked and coerced into coming here. So I've got to entertain that possibility. But I just want to ask you about the Bible, because I've heard you decode the Bible in some of your previous videos. And I think you would say that there is some value in that book. It's not what we're told it is. It's not the literal word of God. It's been translated and, and bloody passed around so many times that how can anyone possibly say that uh, it's intact and its original meaning is all there? But clearly it encodes astrotheology. Clearly, there are uh, metaphors for, uh, well, Jesus is representative of the Son, the Son of God, S-U-N, not S-O-N. And many of the stories of Jesus are simply talking about the journey of the Son through the zodiac and through the uh, astrological year. But also, uh, there are parables, there are allegories, there are life lessons, I guess, uh, which you would find in that book as well. So what's your view on it? Oh, and the other thing is, when you compare the Old and New Testaments, you appear to have two completely different gods. So the God of the Old Testament is psychopathic, he's a sadistic maniac that delights in torture and suffer and death and uh, killing infants. And then by the time you get to the New Testament, God suddenly becomes so caring and so loving that he's willing to come down here in human form and allow himself to be tortured. Although, as you said earlier, he couldn't stop that sort of thing from happening here. He just became subject to it himself. So God's undergone a complete personality change. Maybe he's bipolar, <laughs> but uh, we seem to have two gods. And there's a lot in that book. So what's your view on the Bible now, the value of it, uh, how we should really be reading it? Uh, how do you feel about that whole thing? Yeah, similar to how you've said, it is a mishmash of astro theology and parables and even uh, ancient mushroom cult worship and ideas that they had fertility cults um and it's it's all been translated so many times books added and taken out and yet the people who believe in it believe in the sanctity of whatever the you know latest updated king james uh would be the king james say version uh, you know, that's the ultimate truth from God. These 66 books, ooh, why, why 66? <clears throat> and, and as you said, the um, Old Testament God and the New Testament gods just seem totally different. And then God's son, S-O-N, uh, able to be born, but then murdered for doing, for trying to save the world also doesn't make sense. <laughs> so, so God is all knowing and he, he's got this. <laughs> <laughs> what a big plan. He's all-knowing. He creates Satan. Satan manifests as a talking snake to get this woman to eat an apple uh, as if he didn't know that was going to happen. And then he condemns us for thousands of years thereafter for the thing that he's all-knowing. He had to have known that was going to happen. And then thousands of years later, he's like, I know, I'll try to remedy this by uh, coming to life as a human. And then what, he didn't know it was going to happen, that he's just going to ultimately get killed uh, for trying to do that. So he can't, he can't do better than that. Why can't God's he just... like Homer Simpson. Don't! <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Oops. Yeah, it, that's, that's what you do when you, you incarnate. Like, why not just make things better? <laughs> why incarnate as the worst victim narrative ever? Because that's what it is. It's like you, you created the, the, the best victim narrative ever. And so now the believers, the people that follow it, they follow that victim narrative and their their lives are like that. Um, whereas if you're actually God, why are you a victim in your own creation? <laughs> why don't you just solve it? If you're the savior, save everybody. Why do you go through this whole rigmarole of, of making them sin and fallen and then, oh, coming back and then, oh, believe in me and do my thing and then you'll be... Why couldn't he find Adam in the Garden of Eden? He's looking for Adam. Adam, where yeah. are you? <laughs> That's a good All question. seeing, all knowing, but you can't find Adam in a garden. Exactly. Yeah, so I mean, it does not sound like we are dealing with the capital G God uh, in that book. And that's the big question. And that's what the Gnostics and the Cathars and other uh, Christian sects that have now basically disappeared, 
that's what they believed. That's what they thought about this. Is that like you mentioned Yaldabaoth? I think there's one name they gave him in the um, what are those the texts they found in 1945 there, buried uh, the Dead Sea Scrolls. So there were these ideas in early Christianity that the God referenced in the Old Testament is not the ultimate God, but rather a demiurge, a demigod. And he was very bipolar and psychopathic and jealous and genocidal and all of these things. But even that, as I mentioned with the New Testament, it doesn't gel for me that, oh, okay, well, they messed up or, or they were talking about some other God in the Old Testament, but the New Testament is the real good, all-powerful, all-knowing God, because really, that's what he does? <laughs> it still doesn't make much nice sense. he's a nice one. <laughs> he does it the nice way. It's like good cop, bad cop. I actually made a, a picture of the good cop, bad cop with God and Satan because the Bible really does seem to play that up a lot. Anything bad isn't because of God. He just allowed it. It's all Satan, this this other thing that God created, <laughs> and he's to blame. Blame him. Yeah, oh, right. uh, the um, also I wanted to say about the returning to God aspect. I also wonder you know, like God wakes up and he's the dreamer. Maybe that's not it. I've also wondered and, and almost hoped that it could be something else in that we are not all part of one ultimate God, but we are individual creators in the sense that we can all be gods and all create our own dimensions, realities, worlds, uh, have our own dream. And that way I don't have to lose myself. Like, I don't necessarily like the idea that I die and then, oh, I'm just God. I'm the person who created this hellscape and, and had this nightmare and, and made myself forget everything. What if we can all create our own realities and, and maintain uh, what we had during this lifetime? If we succeed in the after death, death realm without having our memories wiped again, maybe the next thing is our own creative potential. Maybe it's up to us, and we actually get to decide for ourselves. I would be um, ecstatic if, if that was the case, that I get to maintain, you know, still be me. I don't necessarily not want to be me anymore and dissolve myself into the one being or nothingness. I would actually like to be me, but to be much more powerful or maybe all powerful in my own world. So be a god of my own creation, of my own world. Um, I'm open to that being a possibility as well. So I guess I have hope for certain positive things in the afterlife because I have these questions and nobody's given me answers. So I can hope for certain positive outcomes. And that, to me, those are just as likely as me having my memories wiped and reincarnated or going to hell or whatever the negative after death possibilities might be. So I'm, I'm you know, I'm in the middle here. I don't I'm not despairing, like it's definitely going to be terrible, but I'm also not up in the clouds, new agey, like, oh, that's, you know, <laughs> I chose to suffer like this. <laughs> that, that, that never made sense to me either. Yeah. I hear those arguments so often that, you know, we choose to go through these experiences and our souls need this to grow and stuff. But if we circle back around to what we were talking about earlier, the animal kingdom, the food chain, you know, how many times does a gazelle have to be ripped to pieces by a lion for that experience to go back, you know, to source and and the creator can go, oh, OK, now I know what it feels like to be ripped apart by a lion. Why mm. is it necessary for that experience to be repeated billions and billions and billions and billions of times? There and you also go. you could apply that to the human world. You know, how many people have to get cancer? for the creative force to know what it feels like to get cancer. How Absolutely. many people, uh, you know, have to get shot for it to know what it feels like to get shot? You know, uh, why do these experiences keep repeating themselves over and over and over? Right. Now, have you heard of the concept of Lush from Robert Monroe? Yeah, I'm familiar with that concept, yeah. And so, you know, a possible answer to that question as you ponder this, yeah, why why are these things happening over and over again? If it's just for the experience, if it's just for duality, well, is it enough already? How many billions of lives need to be taken? How much suffering actually needs to take place? Unless that is the point. And so the concept of Lush is that there's some kind of energy that the creator or spiritual beings, angels, demons, something outside of this dimension 
get from us. And uh, Robert Monroe was an out-of-body experiencer. Um, you know, he wrote a lot of books on how to do it, and he, you know, did it and experienced many things. And one of the things that he experienced was going to a place where he said that they were um, managing the Lush factory, the, the Lush farm that Earth is, and that this thing that they were um, extracting from this world called Lush came from our negative emotions and energy, basically. Yeah. And and that and the reason maybe that cert, uh, a little bit of good and beauty has to be here is just to keep us in this realm. Like if it was just completely hellish torture, suffering, everything you think of in like a one of those Her Hieronymus Bosch paintings or whatever, um, <laughs> would people even stick around? You'd probably just check out the second you had enough wherewithal to get the heck out of here. Right. Um, I, I wonder that as well. It's like if you were to create a hellish realm to extract the negative energy, like in that movie Monsters, Inc., where the monsters scare the kids and then they extract yeah. their fear energy and that's what feeds them. If that was what this reality was, you do need to have... A it's like the opposite of what they're saying. You need a little bit of positive to counteract the overwhelming negative just to keep people in the facade. Um, I wonder if that could be what's happening here as well. And that would be an answer, a potential answer to to why, you know, <laughs> gazelles have to be eaten a billion times and a billion people need to get cancer and yeah. we still don't have our prayers answered. Because it's not about the experience, it's about the extraction of the loose energy. That mm. idea does make some sense to me. It's not a particularly attractive idea, but I came across mm. it for the first time a while back. And yeah, it does answer some of these questions. Ultimately, of course, we're still left not knowing. But I came across the concept of the soul trap uh, a few years ago as well. And initially I batted it away because it's a pretty horrible idea that you spend your life being lied to and deceived. And then when you finally leave your body and cross over and go back to source, you're still being lied to and deceived and you have more deceptions to work your way through. But this idea has become very popular in recent times. The whole tricked by the light idea. I came across the work of Wayne Bush many, many years ago. I interviewed him about 10 years ago and he was putting forward this idea. Didn't make a lot of sense to me at the time. I'm kind of coming back around to it now, not saying that I necessarily adhere to it or resonate with it, but it's a possibility which is come on the agenda but the whole idea of the soul trap tricked by the light the reincarnation soul loop and the extraction of loose energy has become so popular in recent times that it just makes me wonder what caused that idea to gain momentum in the first place it's a bit like flat earth i guess if you go back you know 10 12 years that idea gained a lot of momentum very quickly i do resonate with that one but a lot of people would say, oh, it must be a CIA sponsored PSYOP if suddenly all truthers are talking about it. You know, there's a reason why it became so popular so quickly. I mean, that one does check out for me because I've looked at all the evidence. But some people are suspicious at this soul trap tricked by the light thing because they'll say, oh, well, it's obviously a PSYOP because it's got everyone talking about it. So any thoughts on where it came from and what validity there might be to it ultimately? Mm. Well, I, I came across it, I guess, the same way you, uh, Wayne Bush and another Mark um, from Forever Conscious Research. Yeah, and, yeah, looking into their work is what, and uh, the Overwatch channel was a, a third one. Those were the the ones that got me into the whole subject. Um, oh, and then uh, I read Howdy Makowski's book. He's been doing some work on that. There's not too many people talking about it, but it does seem to be um well, I, I think like we said with flat earth the way the internet works and the way the human hive mind works i think we do kind of come to things and then we put it out and of course it's gonna gonna pick up uh trending that way but i i do have the same reservations and questions about every answer the reincarnation soul trap area of research has for these questions because i have the exact same problem with them as I do with any religious answer is that they don't know. They're just trying to put dots together um, in a detective way by looking at OBEs and NDEs and um, people's accounts of 
the spirit realm from psychedelic trips and all these kind of things, trying to put the dots together. And to me, that's that's what makes sense to do. That's how we can try to come to some semblance of understanding what's going on here. But ultimately, as with any other thing, there's no foundation to say for sure that the conclusions we're coming to are real. So that's why agnosticism makes so much sense to me, because no matter what area of research I go to, you can never really get ultimate answers for metaphysical questions about the creator or why we're here. And so just accepting that and living in the mystery and trying to be a detective about all things. That's why I read all the religious books. That's part of the detective work. I had to read all every the Bible out there to <laughs> eliminate them, basically. Like, all right, is, is this the truth? Is this the ultimate truth here? Now it just kind of seems like the other religious books. And same with the reincarnation soul trap. You listen to the, everything that they're distilling into. And, you know, it does make a lot of sense to me, but it, it doesn't, I, I don't go, oh, well, that's definitely the truth then. It, we just don't have that level of knowledge here. Ultimately, we're just floundering. And, and that's why I think what we are getting ready for is the big game. At death, that's when you get the opportunity to potentially have something different than what's going on here. Here, you're never going to get to the bottom of it. You're never going to get ultimate truth in this body, in this physical realm. Yeah. So, but once you get out of it, I feel like that it's go time, and we have to prepare for that. Most most people, when you uh, fall asleep and you dream, you don't know you're dreaming until you wake up the next day, and oh yeah. I just had this whole experience that I was nowhere present for until you try lucid dreaming and you get into that. And I think that's like out of body experiences, something that we can do to try and prepare better for what may or may not happen after death. Uh, when you realize that you're dreaming during a dream, you can now control the dream in ways that you couldn't before. And you can have untold fun experiences in them um, through that. And so if by lucid dreaming we can do that, maybe we can wake up in this dream of life after death and lucidly create a better reality for ourselves. As I was saying, maybe I can maintain who I am and be a creator in my own realm if I wake up enough in this dream. Um, so, uh, so lucid dreaming or out of body experiencing is a way that we can become conscious, cognizant outside of our body. You know, when we're not in this physical 5D, uh, you know, five cents, 3D realm. Um, so I think those kind of things are helpful practices that we can do to potentially have a better chance of getting out of here or, or a, a good after life experience, whatever is going to happen there. It's like, how do we prepare for it? Don't know what's going to happen, but I, I would say maybe lucid dreaming and out of body experiences getting familiar with the conscious space outside of your body, outside of this 3D realm, uh, is one thing we can do. And meditation as well, so that you can know, you know, in dreams, you just, you never know where they start. <laughs> You're just in a dream, and at some point you remember it. Even when you lucid dream, you don't lucid from the beginning of it. You're in a dream somehow, and then you have that spark of realization, ah, I'm dreaming. And it's the same with life. Nobody remembers how their life started. Just at some point during your life, you came became conscious enough to be like, oh, I'm living. I'm alive. It's me. So it's like your just metaphorical like we do in, boat. You know, one day you wake up, you're like, oh, I'm in a boat. How did I right. get here? Exactly. We do the same thing every night in our dreams. Oh, now I'm somewhere else. <laughs> How'd I get here? And most of us don't even question that enough to become lucid in dreams or in life. And so I do think that's a practice that we can um, do to help it out and to become lucid in your dreams. One of the things you have to do is ask yourself during daytime, am I dreaming? <laughs> and you say no, but I, I never know, you, you know, no, I'm not dreaming. But then deeper than that, well, yeah, maybe I am. <laughs> right. But when you ask it and you truly are in a nighttime dream, that's the that gives you the ability to wake up because you say, wait, no, this is a dream. I'm asleep right now. And then you can control it. Right. Well, I'm hoping you were right with something that you uh, hypothesized earlier, which is if you question this life, 
and you wonder what you're doing here and you want to discover the answers, that's enough to get yourself out of here. As opposed to these people that you see around you who seem to just be having a great time in life. They're loving it. You know, they're always happy. They're always cracking a joke. They're just going through normal everyday stuff and they seem perfectly fine here. Uh, those of us who, you know, don't particularly want to be here, maybe it's our escape route, our, our way out just by asking those questions and not accepting uh, the conditions that we find ourselves in, but asking why they're here in the first place. And just going back to agnosticism again, I think one of the reasons why it's so unpopular with researchers is because of the ego, because people like to feel that they've got it all figured out. People like answers. They like to be able to put things into a box and say, this is what's going on here. This is how you explain this. And um, that's the reason why so few researchers will put their hands up and say, yes, actually, I'm agnostic. I don't really know anything yeah. uh, but that that is the truth of the matter we don't know anything in these lives these lives are all about asking the questions uh trying to solve the mystery as you said and hopefully one day when we get out of here we discover what it was all about yeah, i think that's human nature too in the sense of how do you become a, an authority and a leading figure or somebody that people point towards if your message is woo <laughs> You know, right. how do you become an agnostic leader? How do you be the agnostic authority? <laughs> it's going to lose paradox. YouTube views that way. <laughs> yeah. So uh, it makes sense that everybody that is an authority figure in these different fields of research has a belief. They have a, you know, they're not agnostic. How can you be agnostic and be a voice of authority about anything? So, And that's why I was referencing say the emperor the children the child talking about the emperor with no clothes or socrates saying that all i know is that i know nothing and that we see him as like the smartest philosopher ever and one of the most celebrated quotes he has is that he doesn't know anything <laughs> so so why is that so clever for a clever man to tell everyone that even he that they think is a genius doesn't know anything and that's so smart to say that but it is, it really is, because it's an admission of what's really going on here. We really don't know these things. The more like you know, you said, the more you we, know, you don't know. Yeah. Well, and we've got that ego, though. The ego does not want to say, I don't know. And the ego wants to be an authority on all things. And especially if you put yourself out there, you'd be an author, you, you make videos or something. It's not appealing to admit that you're not an expert on what you're talking about. It's not appealing to say, I'm not an authority on this subject, but I'm going to keep talking about it. And how are you going to beat the algorithm that way? <laughs> People want authorities. They want experts and answers. And if all you have is questions with no answers, they're going to go elsewhere. They're going to go to the people with the answers. Right. So another subject area that seems to tie in with this idea of simulation theory and uh, trapped by the light and all of this is the Mandela effect, so-called, which I think is really badly named. But we know what concept we're talking about here. This is one that I've been interested in for the past few years. And there are, as far as I'm concerned, some very clear examples of this phenomenon. Uh, I feel there's validity to it. Uh, what do you feel about that? And have you got any ideas of what could really be going on here? Mm. Um, I have seen that certain things have changed that they talk about um, in the sense of, you know, certain video, it tends to happen in mainstream media, uh, DVDs, books, whatever, and they'll change names or phrases or titles from what used to be remembered to something else. Um, and I could see, I mean, th there's many reasons for doing that, and that is a physical thing that can be done by people publishing companies, etc. But there's a, another part of the Mandela Effect lore, which states that, for instance, DVDs and in people's own personal collections or books on their shelves have mysteriously changed over time. So when they were young, the, the Bible on their shelf said one thing, and now when they pick it up, the same physical book says something different. Now this I have not experienced, and this I have I don't believe in this. I would have to see a lot of things um, to make that um, pass my filter. And even if it was true, I have this big question. It's like, so people that think that 
you know, reality is so malleable that DVDs and books on people's shelves are changing. You know, uh, Dolly had braces and now she doesn't. And, uh, you know, sex in the city, sex and the city. Uh, I have no problem with them putting out different copies of the DVDs. And one is this, one's that. But the idea that the one on your shelf changed, if that's the case, <laughs> why on earth does the Mandela effect only affect such silly things like DVDs and books? <laughs> Why doesn't like uh, whole cities disappear or uh, why aren't there huge things happening? Why is it just these tiny little subjective things that nobody can even confirm or deny well, that? Let me just throw one in there, if I may, which is from my own personal observation, the sun seems to have changed. So I always remember the sun as being a golden orange, a golden yellow, you know, throughout the day. Now I see it as a beautiful golden orange at sunset and at sunrise but when it's at its apex in the middle of the day it's white the sun is now white i don't remember it being white seems like something's gone on there mm. not sure about that one but um don't know if that would be part of the mandela effect or not it could just be what you know whatever it is right it just seems like reality has changed in some way i mean real is to me that sounds like climate change and people are trying to say oh climate change it's a thing now it's like well yeah but the climate always changes so with the sun or with you know books or whatever it's like yeah people change books or you know i don't, I don't know we don't know the ultimate nature of the sun um the fact that it changed could have to do with anything but the idea that you're uh, not you but people are mixing them all into this one thing and calling it this mandela effect or like like the, the the name it's after Nelson Mandela people um, having two different ideas about his life and death I guess so it just seems more subjective than objective but it seems like they're trying to turn it into an objective thing by calling it Mandela effect but to me it just seems like a, a very subjective thing okay so we should probably get on to cosmology what do you think you know, sure. <laughs> uh, spinning ball denial. Right. Uh, and one of the things that I get batted back at me so often when I might say to somebody that I reject the spinning earth, you know, heliocentric model is they'll say, please explain to me how a lunar eclipse works. And they'll just leave it at that. They just fire that question at you like that blows the entire theory out of the water. <laughs> but it is the most common question that you seem to get. Please explain how a lunar eclipse works if the Earth is not moving and everything's moving around us. Do you have an easy answer to that? Or explain X, Y, Z. I get not just the eclipse, but, you know, explain how Foucault pendulums work or explain the Coriolis effect. But I do find that interesting that they're rebuttal or their uh, claim of skepticism comes in the form of explain this then. It's not even a question. They're just like forcing you to present something so that they can scoff at it. Because no matter what I say about eclipses or the Coriolis effect or a Foucault pendulum or why, uh, a big one is why would they lie? Yeah, but why? You know, they don't even want to hear about you could be given 200 proofs, you know, that the earth is one way and they'll just be like yeah but why though why would they lie and unless you can give them a satisfactory answer to why then they're just no nope, i'm just going to keep believing what i already believe and i find the explain me this questions that aren't even questions are the same thing these are defense mechanisms and deflection tactics to just get you talking so that they can snarkily you know be snarky and smile and sarcastic and laugh at you which is why i don't recommend doing explanations like even you you're trying to get me to explain it i don't want to explain what an eclipse is i don't know <laughs> it's it's again agnosticism when you ask about celestial events it's very different from the terrestrial but we've been uh indoctrinated to combine the two constantly by theoretical astronomy and astronomers who you know oh you want to know what the earth is look up there look at this look at that uh flat earth has everything to do with geology and geography and has nothing to do with astronomy and the things that are happening up there so i actually have lots of questions about the moon the sun and the stars not too many answers um 
though I can expose how eclipses don't work. And that's the main thing that we do with the globe is that we show that the explanations that we've been given for the model that we've been shown don't suffice. And then instantly, again, human nature, they want a new answer. Well, then explain this to me then. It's like, I'm, I'm not saying here's the new thing for you to believe in. I'm saying stop believing in this thing that doesn't work. And it's similar to say the, the soul trap or the, the theology topics we're talking about. All the religious people, they come to me with these same questions. Well, then what this, Eric? Well, then what that? And it just, I don't have the answers for that. I just don't, I'm not satisfied by the answers that everyone else is satisfied with. And so that's all I would have to say about the eclipse. How does it happen? Well, it may happen because there's a third body uh, a translucent dark body called Rahu, the black sun that uh, ancients believed existed, and that steals the sun and the moon's light. Um, they have mythologies about it. But am I going to say concrete? Yes, this thing that I've never touched or experienced or can, can prove, this is why eclipses happen. Now, believe me, stop believing in NASA. No, I'm not an authority like that. I haven't been there like that. So I'm not going to speak like that. But that is what people want. And so those are the questions you constantly get. It's like, well, then explain this. And if you don't explain it, they're, pff, pff, they just scoff at you. You don't really know then. It's like, mm. yeah, that's how I started. I, that's why I said, I don't know. And neither do they. That's what nobody wants. to. They don't want to hear that their authorities don't know what they're talking about. And they don't want to hear that they don't know what they're talking about. Even though you're willing to say, I don't know what I'm talking about. They're like, all right, well, then you're below me. Rather than actually listening to your questions and admitting, huh. Those really don't have satisfactory answers, do they? You can't hang an entire world view on one question that can't be answered. You know, uh, just because you might not be able to answer one particular question that somebody would have, it doesn't mean your entire theory or uh, the way you view something is false. It just means that's one unexplained element of it. What about all the others? You know, you might have three questions that you can't answer to support the heliocentric model but 500 reasons not to accept a uh, sorry a geocentric model but 500 reasons not to accept a heliocentric model it doesn't right. blow the entire contention out of the water it's just another unanswered question and when you pay attention you realize there's quite a few of them around in all areas of our lives and again going back to the motive you know if there's a serial killer on the loose and he's murdered 15 people you don't say, well, why would he do that? You know, th those people can't be dead because why would anyone go around doing that? You don't know why he did it. You just know that it happened. So you don't know. You can, you can ask why, why, but not right. at the exclusion of evidence. Right. <laughs> First, look at the evidence. But everyone else is like, no, if you don't give me a satisfactory motive, I'm not even looking at the evidence. And that's a terrible detective. <laughs> right. So if it's a lie, it's a lie. It doesn't really matter why somebody might may have lied if you can prove it to have been a lie. Right. And you've provided more than enough proofs to show that the traditional model of where we live and what we're told about it just doesn't stack up right and if somebody Makes says okay so now what's the truth eric well i don't know i exposed the liar why why do i now have to be your new authority that tells you all the new truth that wasn't right. that, I, I didn't sign up for that yeah. <laughs> all i did was say the emperor has no clothes peace out <laughs> don't, the don't now come to me you... like i know all the answers no i just have the questions you explain what something is by explaining what it isn't. So right. you negate all the things that it can't possibly be. Right. And then all other possibilities remain on the table. That's, That's a pretty it. good way of going about it. And a general rule of thumb, which can be applied in life, I find. And again, it's observable, testable, repeatable scientific method is anything that comes from any kind of mainstream source. If it's the BBC Evening News or CBS or Fox or whatever, if it's some government minister or some uh, academic educational body, which is part of the establishment, anything they tell you is going to be a lie or is certainly not going to be the truth. So you start with that foundation. Just assume they're lying to you and take whatever they're telling you and look in the opposite direction for the truth. Mm -hmm. And you may well just find it there you won't find it in whatever they dish up to you. That is a general rule of thumb which, with which you won't go far wrong in this world. That's another one, kind of like your reverse karma. It's like, so if this world was an intentionally, supposedly good creation, right. 
Why is it that way then? <laughs> right. So, you know, I spend a lot of time exposing the entertainment and popular culture industries and how they do things like predictive programming. So they put the truth of a particular situation or the truth of these lives into movies, TV shows, music videos. People watch those things and they think it's just fantasy, imagination. Somebody's just made it up. Nobody imagines that they're getting the truth from those kind of vehicles. Then they'll go and switch on the BBC Evening News, listen to the newscaster and think, oh, this is the truth of what's happening in the world. Whereas actually the ex exact opposite is true. It's inversion. So mm -hmm. the news is lying to you. That's the fantasy. That's the wild trips of imagination. Whereas the movies, TV shows and music videos are telling you the truth. Mm. If you can decode the symbolism and the numerology and all the rest of it. So it's like that reverse karma thing. You know, uh, the more good you do, the more suffering you reap, the more mm. of a selfish shit you are, uh, the easier ride you'll seem to have in this life. So it's the opposite mm -hmm. of what people assume. People assume that the more good work you do and the better person you try to be, the nicer life you'll have, the easier ride you'll have through life. No doesn't work that way they, they seem to think they both exist though because like for instance christians they accept that um people sell their soul to the devil and then they get all of these material rewards in this life for it um but then at the same time you're supposed to sell <laughs> your soul to jesus and then you're going to get afterlife rewards for that right uh either way you're having to buy into some thing that's not your of your own making, say. Yeah, they'll say, uh, if you sell your soul to the devil, you have a nice life here, but then you'll go to hell. Whereas if you sell your soul to Jesus, you might have a shitty life here, but you'll have heaven when you die. <laughs> and have it both so, ways. When do you want your shit sandwich? <laughs> Before right. your ice cream sundae or after? <laughs> exactly, yeah. <laughs> In this life or what lies beyond mm. whatever that may be why do you think you've become such a target for joe rogan and others <laughs> you know you're you're like that guy that they go to to try and ridicule flat earth it's always your name that comes up why do you think you've become such a target for that sort of uh, you know, the go-to guy i i guess i i was the first person to really spark this up in 2014 that started the modern resurgence and I also did the dinosaurs never existed topic. I sparked that as well. And that was brought up by Trevor Vale, the paleontologist on the Joe Rogan show. And then my flat earth stuff was brought up um, by Eddie Bravo, who's also Joe's friend on his show. So I think the cross section of <laughs> those two things coming at him, um, and it was public, they both came out during live podcasts and so that created an after effect in which other people started talking about it and there was a time there about 2015 2016 that uh I, there was a couple of whole shows basically where they i mean they went through one of my videos and were talking about me and then they said they were going to have a debate set up with me neil degrasse tyson and joe and they nothing ever became of it they just stopped contacting me and it was i mean Suspiciously, my YouTube, my second YouTube channel got deleted right around that same time. Would you under, have gone on that debate? Yes. Yeah, I'd already accepted it. Right. Um, and uh, supposedly so had Neil. And it was on Joe's website and he mentioned it on air that it was going to happen. Um, but then I, I never spoke to Joe. I always spoke through Eddie. Eddie would message me. And so Eddie messaged me and he's like, oh, we're not doing it. And then he had Neil Tyson on and he said it on air. He's like, no, no. I'm not gonna not gonna give airtime to that guy or something. So they just flip flopped both of them after accepting this, and never even got back to me to give me some explanation about exactly what it was. They're just like, nope, we just decided not to. And so I think that, you know, they started saying my name for all these reasons and to laugh at me and you know, look at this idiot type of thing. But I, I never went away, and I started making more sense to more people, and. So since 2016, they have just, I haven't heard my name once since then. They, they were talking about me all the time, and now they've, I've just gone off off their radar. And I think that's on purpose, because they realized that, like the Streisand effect, they call it, by trying to 
you know, denounce me. They're just bringing more people to my name. So they realized, no, we just got to stop talking about him. And so that's what their new MO has been since around 2016. Even though before, yes, I was just I was supposed to be the laughing stock, and that's how they were going to deal with flat Earth and dinosaurs don't exist and all this. They were going to David IQ. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Just going back to how we started out with this conversation, you know, the spiritual stuff, the theology. I was really surprised by just what a response I got to that first video that I put out. The is God really good? I mean, admittedly, it was a provocative title. That title was always going to trigger certain people. But, you know, I did that for a reason because I wanted to spark debate and get people thinking about these things. But I put out this video in April 2020 at the start of the nonsense or the convid debacle, you know, and this was my car rant. This is where I just got really pissed off one day when I went into town and I saw the ridiculous ways in which people were behaving and had been coerced into certain behaviours through fear, propaganda. And it just made me mad that mm -hmm. uh, that's what society had become so quickly. It had been so easy to condition that many people. And I came back, locked myself in my car, uh, recorded a video and just let rip and just ranted and that video really took off it became viral i guess you would say excuse the pun um, i think you uh, used it yourself and put some graphics to it and put it out there as well but the video that i did the other week which has sparked these god debates has eclipsed even that and i've been surprised by just what a talking point has become because I do a lot of speaking events and conferences and stuff so for the last three weekends I've been at different conference events and so many people there have come up to me and said oh Mark saw your video and uh, oh I think this and uh, oh I saw the response from this guy and whatever it's got a lot of people talking about it and um, that kind of surprised me because I put out a lot of videos but there's something about this subject that has really got a lot of people talking and I wonder if it's an idea whose time has come. It's a kind of zeitgeist type thing, you know, similar to Flat Earth, I guess, many years ago. People were ready to talk about it then. And now people just seem to be talking about this stuff. Uh, yeah. Admittedly, many of them are denouncing me for what I'm saying and, uh, you know, accusing me of being in a dark place. But, uh, yeah, it seems like an idea whose time has come, basically. And I've experienced similar to what you said that the people that are coming and condemning me in the comments section almost exclusively come from the same one religion. Christians. Right. I've had no I pissed do, off I, Buddhists, no pissed off Zen, Jain, whatever. <laughs> yeah. Only one group. <laughs> no Hindus, no no Jews. Uh, I think I might have had one Muslim. I've not even um, had a pissed off atheist. Right. No, no. So, and isn't that interesting? Like, why are the other religions seemingly more open or able to take it in? And and also other Christians. That's the other thing. I, point I wanted to make is, you know, my family, my parents are Christian. They watch every video I make. I talk to them about these subjects all the time, and th they they say, hmm, interesting idea. I wonder about that too. You're making me question things. And to me, that's normal. <laughs> so when I see other so-called Christians in my comment section just lambasting me and condemning me and calling me antichrist for these things that I discuss with my Christian parents every day, <laughs> and they don't they don't treat me that way. So I, I do find it funny that there are certain Christians. Uh, yoga is another one. I you know I teach yoga. I do yoga. And they'll they'll tell me that I'm you do satanic yoga poses, Eric. You're doing the antichrist system of yoga, and you're you're worshiping the Hindu gods when you do those poses. I'm like, they're healthful stretches. I'll tell you, I'm not. I don't worship Hindu gods. I'm not Hindu. I don't believe in that religion. I I do yoga for and meditation for other things that have nothing to do with Hindu spirituality. You know, it's my own version of it. I call myself a rogue yogi. I'm not like a Hindu yogi. I, I don't do the things that they do. Uh, I have my own ideas about certain things, and I do what makes sense to me. And so that's the same with religion, you know, or my lack of, thereof, is I'm going to do what makes sense to me and follow my own path rather than look for one that seems like it's doing a good job and try to follow it. Well, 
I think I'm about done here in terms of what I wanted to ask you. I don't know if there's anything you want to ask me uh, if we start to wrap up. No, no, I think this has been a great talk. We can uh, wrap it up there, leave it at a nice length that um, people will uh, be able to digest. Sure. Yeah, it's been a pleasure talking to you. It's been great to kick it to you, yeah. And uh, we're on a similar page with a lot of things, not everything, but, you know, that's that's good. That's healthy. And mm -hmm. uh, I thought it was a really stimulating conversation. And again, just going back to what I said earlier, it's interesting that we're arriving at uh, similar viewpoints or questions, at least at the same sort of time. You're over there in America. I think you were in Thailand before, was it? Yeah. Yeah. I spent the last 20 years in Thailand, but I just moved back to Maine. Right. And yeah. I'm here in England. But for some reason, you know, we're coming across these same ideas at the same time. So something's going on here, whatever right. it may be. But yeah, great conversation, brother. Thanks. I appreciate you coming on and uh, hopefully we'll be able to speak again sometime. Sure. Well, I'm coming over to America actually in April. I'm doing, uh, I'm lining up four talk events for myself in Boston, Philadelphia, New York and New Haven. And it turns out there's a solar eclipse going on during the mm. time that I'm going to be there. So I do want to try and catch that. I think I've got to go up to Niagara Falls, Buffalo and be in totality there for about four minutes. But it would be a shame to come all the way out there and not experience it. You know, I've mm. never experienced a solar eclipse. So whatever may be causing it, I would like to have that experience. I imagine uh, people could get tickets from from you or I'll, I'll put your website or your email down below. Oh, for the talks? Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I've got tickets on Eventbrite for each of those. So anyone that's in those areas that can get to uh, Boston, Philadelphia, New York, New Haven, that's the 3rd, the 6th, the 7th and the 10th of April where I'll be doing those. Uh, sure. Yeah. Be great to see people there. Excellent. All right. Well, hope you have a good time here stateside and uh, it's been a good conversation and hope you have a great rest of the day. Sure. Thanks, brother. All, All right. Peace. Cheers.